Hello and welcome to That Pedal Show. Dan here. Mick here. Hello. Right. Ominous title to this video. Yes. Uh, your first ever pedal board. Mm. Do you remember your first pedal board? I do. I remember mine very clearly. I'm not sure there was an actual defining first one. There was a first few attempts. Okay. And some some false starts. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. No, same here. Yeah. So the idea with today's video, we, you know, obviously all of our stuff is, you know, when you see the board in each week and, you know, we spend a lot of time making sure that, you know, everything's great and there's lots of pedals and things on there, but lots of guys who have come to the channel recently are basically starting out or they've, they've, they've acquired their first bunch of pedals. So the question is, how do you actually go from having your first few pedals to actually having a pedal board? Yes, that fateful moment when you stare down at the floor and you see a bunch of wires everywhere, mm -hmm. a few multicolored boxes and three patch cables that work and three that kind of sort of work. Yep, and it's you taking go, you half hour to set those up. Yeah, it's time to be a grown up and or at least go back to being a child again and <laughs> play with some toys and actually have a proper yeah. pedal board. Nice. So, um, that time has arrived and you've decided it's time for your first board. So the questions today are, I've got it written down here. When do I need a pedal board? Important question. When do you need a pedal board, Dan? I think three loose pedals is okay. I think anything more than that, I think you need some organization. Yep, and you need it for various reasons which we'll come on to. Um, what do I need to make a pedal board? Mm -hmm. You need... Well, you need a board to start with, and there's, you know, we have loads of options as far as that's concerned. You've got to be able to stick the pedals to the board. You've got to be able to join those pedals together. You've got to be able to power the pedals. Um, you might need to carry it around. Yeah, you might need to carry it around. So all the bits you need to, yeah. to actually come up with some functioning type of pedal board. Mm -hmm. And what are the advantages of having a pedal board, Dan, as opposed to a collection of mess on the floor? Well, the first thing is, your setup time is reduced by a factor of 10. Yeah, and even if you're not gigging, that can mean setup time at home as well. Yeah, definitely. So, you know... If you need to practice... Any right? barrier to entry is... Anything that potentially stops you from playing the guitar... There you go. ...needs to be eliminated. Yep. And if you get some really cool sounds on your board and you make it easy and accessible, you know, you, you're going to enjoy your playing time that much more. Yep, so it'll save you some time. That's that's the first advantage. Second advantage is it can actually protect your pedals a little bit. Yes. Because they're on a board, they're in an environment where they're not clunking around in a bag maybe mm -hmm. or, you know, just subject to the usual wear and tear of daily being chucked around. Yep. You can often get a more consistent result with everything sort of, you know, neat and locked down on a board as opposed to unplugging things and plugging things in and wear and tear on patch leads, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, might save you some money on batteries because you might move from batteries to a power supply, that yes. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, the most important thing of all is we hope it's going to help you sound better. Yeah. And that is the main advantage. And it's the stepping stone into things that may come down the line. Yes. But or it's may a, not, depending on how you're... But it's an important step. It's a very important step. When you go from just playing around with the pedals, you get to a point and think, right, this is it now. I need a board. So today we're not going to include any fancy switches. We're not going to include anything terribly complex. Mm. We're literally going to take three or four pedals. Dan and I are going to go off now and we're going to put together what we would consider to be a starter pedal board. Yeah. What I consider to be a starter pedal board. <laughs> Um, we will talk about budget along the way, but of course everyone's yeah, yeah, budget yeah. is different, so we're not going to do the, you know, it needs to be under 200 quid or anything like that, but we will um, choose, well, you'll see what we're about to do, because we're going to do it now. Okay, first step. Knowing what pedals you've got to put on the board is going to inform you as to at least the size of the board that you need. Have you decided what you're going to have on your I have. I've chosen. I, we were talking about when you need a pedal board, mm. and we were both saying that more than three pedals makes kind of sense. So yeah. I've chosen four pedals, and I've chosen them very deliberately. Some old thing that I've had lying around for yep. years, yep. Um, which you know you've you've had. It's been in the bottom of a bag. This one's even got a knob missing. Happens to be quite a collectible pedal, but yep. anyway, that's nice. that's your that's your old pedal that you got hanging around. Something new and exciting that you've got all gassy for and you've been on the internet, you've watched that pedal show, you've got, God, I like that. 
Yeah, and you've gone onto uh, the web and you bought something. So I've got a delay pedal. Mm -hmm. I've got another overdrive because I like to have two overdrives. For me, an ideal, like the first pedal you ever buy, if you use any overdrive sounds at all, is an overdrive pedal. Yes. If you're yes. a clean person and you don't use overdrive sounds, the first pedal you probably ever buy is a delay pedal. Right. Or maybe a reverb. So yeah. I'm covering both grounds. I've got two overdrives of different flavors. Nice. Yeah. And then finally, I've got something that I think is going to be useful and that's going to make me want to play, which yes. is a looper pedal, so I can um, do loops and play. And I guess, for, I don't know what you think, Dan, but for me, overdrive delay is where it starts. Mm -hmm. And then you add something of flavor. So you might add a modulation or you might add something that, that kind of suits your personality or is not a universal kind of effect where I was I was I would consider that overdrive and delay are kind of universal. Yeah, effects. I think yeah, I think certainly when I when we got my first board uh, or you know first started playing around with pedals and delay seemed to be quite a, an extravagance yeah. event, you know. Same thing. So but uh, now it's absolutely because the more that you interact with that the more you realize actually there's, this is a really important part of, of my sound. Yeah. So uh, what, what have you chosen? So 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 speaking of delay, so I, I've gone down the more I've been watching too much that pedal show route. Um, I've gone for so I love my Memory Man um, delay. This is a Memory Man that's got tap tempo on it. I've had this around for a while. We're using this in a video tomorrow. Oh yeah. Because I have a special guest coming out, so I thought it'd be really cool to put this. Make on sure the it board. works. Make sure it works exactly. Um, we had the gentleman, um, from Josh, Josh from, from Snouse uh, Electronics or Snouse Electric Company, who makes these great clones of the uh, original Blues Breaker overdrive pedal. Well, it's no coincidence that I have a Blues okay, Breaker inspired overdrive right, pedal right. too. So and we'll, we'll explain why that might exactly, be. Exactly, exactly. And then the Rattler, this blew my mind when we had it on the show. I used it at a gig, the, the last gig that we did, and yeah, phenomenal. So, um, and then I've got a little bit of movement. I've actually chosen a tremolo. Yeah, great. Because um, I wanted to also do a bit of placement thing. But another reason for the delay actually is because this has a different power requirement than the other standard Nubot things. And we'll talk about power yep. in a sec. And I'm also, I've stepped down, I've just included a tuner. Yeah, the biggest question among uh, under my choices will be, where's your tuner? And you yeah, know, surely yeah. a tuner is an essential pedal. Um, yes or no? <laughs> you can put, because you've got headstock options and things yeah, like yeah, that yeah, as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I've, I've, I've put that on there because when I get to five, I've got a different relationship with the size yeah you've you got know so what do i do do i start moving things around so i want you know okay so this is gonna so none of these pedals are very beginnery the trilocopter is inexpensive yep um the ditto is ditto, re yep. relatively inexpensive that's relatively inexpensive yeah this you could call boutique this is vintage and collectible yeah but you know you're so up there's nothing... that to you at christmas <laughs> he was you know he had a few too many shandies and he says Oh, I got one of these kicking around in the boots somewhere. And I can't that. use this anymore, yeah. son. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so none of this. We're not a beginner pedal board. Doesn't have to be the cheapest possible pedal board. That's yeah. not. That's not the point. It's just when we get there. So once you've chosen your pedals, they've got to go on something. A couple of important things, though. Um, when I, I remember when I first measured up my first pedal board, I got my pedals and I thought, okay, how much room do I need? <laughs> I did this. Measure it, thought, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, it's really important that you need to remember that there's going to be a distance between each pedal because you've got a patch lead. Uh, and not only that, if I have this pedal that close, getting between the foot switches is a real issue. So make sure when you measure up that you have enough distance between the pedals that is A, going to let you get your patch leads in there without uh, you know, trying to, um, you know, smash things together. And B, you have enough distance between the pedals that you can comfortably get your feet in there and turn things on and off. So. Boards. Boards. Uh, I've gone for a pedal train. For the simple reason that uh, 
This particular pedal train comes in a soft case. And they also come in many different sizes. Yes. We've got many pedal trains between us. We do. This one is a Metro 20, I guess because it's 20 inches long. That's mm -hmm. a Metro 16 because it's 16 inches long, I guess. That's right. Uh, so yep, yeah, there's a hard case and a soft case option. This size, it gives me just enough room um, to get everything on there, but... Oh, you might be struggling there, Dad. Uh, well, it's, it's tight. You know, so gonna that, fiddly, fiddly. I'm going to have to go a bit of fiddly fiddly um, to, to work this out. I could if I wanted to, you know, I've got some room at the top, but then I'm stepping over pedals. Um, but for the moment, I think, you know, I can make this size work. Yep, yeah, we'll come to that. Um, there are so many different types so of pedal many. board available. This is from um, Alder and Ash pedal boards in the UK, like a, uh, what you might call a boutique, nice wooden pedal board. And they have a range of things in different sizes. I don't know, but you can probably order a bespoke one. Um, I'll just quickly just point this out as well. So this groove down the center here, and the whole idea, the same thing with the grooves in the, in the pedal trains, it's so that you've got uh, routing options for your cables. Yeah. Um, instead of running the cable sort of uh, between the pedals like this, you can go directly underneath the cable, uh, but you know, the pedals uh, between each other. Uh, it just makes things neater. That's yeah. what those grooves we'll are. We'll get for. to that when we start talking about wiring in a minute. Yeah. As we said, there are many, many, many different types of pedal case until you get right up to crazy, you know, professional, full on, Highly expensive. Yeah. Things. Multi twin tier, multiple. Yeah. You know, catch bays on the inputs and outputs yeah. and all that stuff. This is this is not for today, but that's no. what you're aiming for. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's that's the end game. Maybe. Or not, maybe that kind of thing feels yeah. like a horror. Well, so that's um by a company called Schmidt Array. Yep. And they cost many hundreds, right? And this is from a company called BQ, it costs many pounds. This is a, a duck board. Uh, it's you know one of those things you can't jump out of the shower on. If you're on a serious serious budget, you can go onto B and Q, pay ten pounds for one of these, yeah. and a, you know a bit of black paint if you want it. IKEA these, shelves, like, all the IKEA, IKEA shelves, perfect. all kinds of things. Yeah, perfect. and in a similar vein, I I've actually made one out of bits of wood. Here's one I made earlier, um, which we, was on a video from a couple of years ago. But as you can see, this is just strip wood, soft strip wood. From any, you know, B and Q or any any of those kind of stores. Yeah. And it's it's constructed with rails. Mm -hmm. So that what Dan was saying is you can run cables in and out. Mm -hmm. A front thing, a back thing, mm -hmm. and I've made the back thing taller than the front thing, so it's angled ever so nice. slightly towards me. Yep, lovely. And then just screwed together with screws, and that, you know, cost. The cost of however many bits of wood that is, not sure. many. Um, yeah. So it comes down to identifying what you're using your pedal board for. If your band has suddenly got a tour and you're out supporting someone for a couple of months and you're going to be flying, you're going to need something like you're going to need something with a hard case, something that you can, you know, that's going to be able to be thrown around a bit. If this is something for you to go to a jam night, you know, once a month. And just set up and play in your bedroom. It's a very different proposition. Well, whatever, so, yeah, I mean, you can put that in a sports bag. Exactly. Or, you yeah. know, put a bit of foam around it in the yep. bottom of your bag and chuck all the leads on top. But as Dan was saying, the pedal trains come with either a soft case like this, yep. um, in the different sizes. That's and, actually a yeah. Diego, a different brand, right. which I've appropriated for this. Nice. And these are great if you're doing if you're doing local gigs. You're not flying anywhere. These are fantastic. You, you know, just pop, you know, once you've got everything else in the van, you just put these on, on top, the top and you're golden. Yeah, yeah. The one, one great benefit of soft bags is no one puts any cabinets on the top of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The minute it's a flight case, something goes on top. Yeah, of course. Nice. So tell me about layout. How are you going to lay these pedals out? Okay. As far as signal path is concerned, um, my guitar is going to go into the tuner. Then that's going to go into the, the Rattler, which is the higher gain pedal. That then is going to go into the black box, which is the lower gain pedal. Now, uh, the reason I do it this way around is that I can also use the black box for a solo boost for the, the heavier gain pedal. Uh, to be fair, I don't set it up 
um, with the craziest amount of gain. Super it's, heavy, yeah. it's 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 you know it's a big thick sounding thing. We have done videos on pedal order, so if you're in any way confused about that, they're they're worth watching. It's also worth saying if if you if you're new to this, the majority of the Western world mm -hmm. goes left to right, right. So when you read a book, they just turn that way. When you write, you write across a page that way. Kind of makes sense for things to yeah. go that way if you're right-handed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, with signal chain, it's the other way. You go from right to left. Yeah. Simply because on most pedals, the input tends to be on that side, mm -hmm. and the output tends to be on that side. It didn't always start like that. The earliest pedals had the input on the left-hand side, but the problem fuzz was fuzz face. With fuzz face, uh, yeah, the mutron. The the problem was with the guitar if. Generally, uh, there's a lot more right-handed guitar players than left-handed, and the output of the guitar was on the right-hand side. And if the input of the pedal was on the left-hand side, your cable huh. was actually crossing in front of you. Never thought about that before. Yeah. <laughs> so and it's it's really uncomfortable. Yeah. So they ended up having the input on the right-hand side so that you had a clear path to your pedals. <laughs> never never thought about that. There you go. So the the, the um, I guess the thing to remember is when we're talking about pedals first in the chain, we mean those further to the right, yeah. towards the beginning of the signal chain, and yeah. when we talk about at the end of the signal chain, we're talking about further to the left, which is nearer your amp. So the, the ones on, if you look at the board from the top down, the ones at that end are nearest your guitar, and the sure. ones at that end are nearest your amp. I appreciate that that is very simplistic, but when you're coming to build your first pedal board, you might not know that. Yeah. Now, that's signal path. However, layout can be a little bit different. For example, I might say, um, right, I use uh, my, you know, I use the jam, the rattler, and the delay, and I always have those on together. So even though my signal path, this would be going first into that, and then into the memory man, what I would do is have, say, the tuner here, and that would go out into the rattler, out of the rattler, into the black box, out of the black box, underneath, and then into the memory man. The reason being is that I might want to, with one, if I can get my foot across here, <laughs> with one press, turn them on at the same time. Um, so you, there are little tricks like that that you can do. Um, even though you have shorter cable runs, if you run everything in the proper order, but you can, do little tricky things like that, like you know, turn yep. the pedals on with once. So they don't necessarily have to be those in the, that signal path order. I think those are the things that develop over time, don't they? Yes. As you start to realise. Yeah. So what Dan's done with his board, he's he's chosen a board that's just about big enough to get all his pedals on. So if he now buys another pedal, <laughs> exactly, I'm done. He's Stop. he's got to buy another board. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, or you get rid of one pedal and put another one on there. So it it really depends whether you want to think about longevity. So for example, with the uh, B and Q special here. I've got plenty of options, plenty of options for growth. So adding another one or two pedals on there feels like it's a possibility. Sure. Um, before I've got to buy my next pedal board. So um, that's something to think about as well, is like, you've got three pedals today, how long is it before you're gonna have six? Yeah. So, and with me, I'm just gonna go straight in a line because that's how the brain works. Yeah. It means I've got a lot of dead space, but that's okay. What the dead space is means going. you're going to be thinking, oh, if I maybe I can get that there, I can, that'll fit there. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Could you know that whole rail could come off? You could right. go that small if you just wanted to make one that had two shelves on, which is essentially what Pedal Train Nano is. Right. I've uh, got one of those kicking around somewhere. It's just two rails, but mm -hmm. so yeah, I'm going to go with that. I'm going to give myself plenty of space, um, and in terms of order, I'm going to do. Just for the halibut, I'm going to do the opposite of Dan. I'm going to have my cleanest pedal first. I'm going to have my dirty pedal next. Dirtier. So one of the reasons for choosing two overdrives is they have different sounds. Mm -hmm. This one's kind of clean, classic, um, with a bumpy mid-range. Yep. This one is much dirtier, uh, with a flatter EQ curve. Mm. That will become relevant as we go on. Actually, it's important to mention, so the way that um, I was saying I stack mine, I'm using the black box as an overdrive boost. So with Mick, 
with stacking the tube screamer into the rune stone, he'll have a, uh, like an increased gain option. So um, by having the the higher gain last and the lower gain first, and then punching that into the higher gain thing, it, it, it pushes the signal into the higher gain pedal and gives you like an increased gain. So basically with these two pedals, you have three uh, basic yeah. gain options. And, and which way around you place them it changes that. Yeah, I've already changed my mind. So they're going <laughs> that way um, Delay, usually for most, um, I say for most commonly, the, the most, I don't want to say normal. <laughs> The accepted place for delay is after overdrive, although you can put it before. Mm -hmm. And I'm putting my looper on the end because I want my looper to catch everything that I play. Nice. So that's going to be my order. Nice. The next thing to consider, not necessarily the next step in building your board, but you need to consider this step now, is how you're actually going to attach your pedals to the board. Now, uh, most people use Velcro. We have this side of the Velcro, which is called the loop side, and then we have the hook side of the Velcro. One side goes on your board, one side goes on your pedals, and then it sticks to it. There are some common issues with said Velcro. Uh, the first being that it is, it's certainly convenient, however, it's not necessarily a strong option. So for example, if I'm building a touring pedal board, I won't use Velcro. I'll use um, pedal board tape or something with a, with a stronger uh, adhesion to the, to the pedals. Or I'll, I'll use pedal board tape on the pedals and maybe hook Velcro on the bottom so that it's still very strong, but you can change them if you want. Um, a really important step uh, or tip, I should say, with the Velcro, with the hook side of the Velcro, uh, oh, sorry, with the loop side of the Velcro, don't just put, you know, the the hook side on there and then the same, you know, the same amount uh, on the board. Because what tends to happen is, if you've only got the same amount of uh, hook side uh, Velcro as the loop side, then as you pull the pedal off, you'll just pull the, you know, the, the base yeah. of the hook off. It will come off. Exactly. So it's always best if you have the option to use long strips of the loop side on the bottom, and then it's a lot more difficult for the, you know, if you're pulling this pedal off here, you have the extra tension on, on you know, either side of that, that keeps that in place. Which is what I'm gonna do now. So, um, the way to do this, personally, I think it's always better to line the whole board. So if you've made your own board like this, if you put it on the whole board, that gives you the option of moving anything around to any place you want. If you very precisely cut tiny little squares out and stick that pedal there and that pedal there and that pedal there, you're then very limited about how you can move it about. So measure it out to the full width of the board, cut it off, and then stick it on, making sure you have a clean and dust-free surface. So we'll just measure that up a bit like that, stick it on at that end, and you know doing anything on, like this on camera means I'm going to mess it up. But no! Awesome! And if you do it like that, you don't get any air bubbles in the Velcro as you go along, and then that will give you something to put your pedal on, like so. I'll just do the next one if Dan can find any more Velcro. If he can't, we're going to have to improvise. Another option, uh, which is much less wide to use, but uh, it's still a good option, is cable ties. Right. Now, the great thing about cable ties is they're, once they're on, you have to snip them to get them off. They, they really secure the pedal in place. Um, now, uh, there's a bunch of different ways to do this. A lot of people, once they have the connections in place, they let you put the cable ties in around the connections and sort of you know, uh, cable tie that to the board. Um, other people will cross, so you can cable tie them on the board like that. However you do it, once the cable tie's on, that's it. You have to 
if you want to change anything, you've got to cut the cable tie and then start again. But once it's on though, there's you know nothing will make that fall off by itself. So Martin Smith from Schmidt Array. God bless that man. Lifesaver. Send us, send us some Velcro to the pedal board builder that you were doing for somebody or other. Okay. Anyway, so I've now got more soft side Velcro. Great. Oh, look at that. Nice. What a beauty, Daniel. Now, uh, here's a question. Why does the soft side or the loop side go on the bottom and the hook side go on top? Um, I don't actually know, other than that's how you told me to do it. Okay. Oh, no, I do know. Right. No, I don't. Imagine that you've got, uh, you know, you've taken the pedals off your board and you put them on carpet or something. If you've got the, the hook side on there, it's not going to move on the carpet. Um, m most of the, uh, you know, the, the floor or the soft finishes on top of the board, the hook will work. But if you have the, the loop side on the bottom, then uh, it just slides around all over the place. So I've always, I think the, the, yeah, the general consensus is the hook side on the pedal and the loop side on the board. And if you always do it the same way, you avoid that time where you go to put the pedal on the board and exactly. you've, got, you've got loop side on both sides. Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, it, it makes sense to do one. So the next thing we were talking about was pedal board tape. Pedal board tape. You refer to pedal board tape, which you can find if you search on Amazon or the gigrig.com. Uh, you can find pedal board tape, which is actually 3M dual lock. That's it. And you can buy 3M dual lock under the 3M brand as well. And all it is, it's basically, it's the same. Little mushrooms. Little mushrooms. So it's the same front and back. And as Dan said, if you use that stuff on the board and on the pedals, mm -hmm. it is an unbelievably strong bond. Yep. So if you want to be completist, you can do that. So here we've got our loop side Velcro. I'll cut just little squares, right? Because you don't need much. And the other great thing about cutting little squares is, I may as well cut that in half, um, you can be very efficient with the tape. Mm -hmm. So, on it goes onto your pedal. The other good thing about this stuff is on most pedals, it doesn't mark, you can pull it off and it won't pull the paint off most pedals. Yeah. And I'm gonna say most pedals because it's not always the case. The big thing with the pedal board tape is the glue that's used on this side is, is really strong. It's, it's so much stronger than the glue that's used on your Velcro. Um, so it's a really good option, you know. So I put that on there and I try and put it on so that I don't cover the screws up yep, so point. that I can just about get to the screws if the bottom needs to come off the pedal mm -hmm. for any reason whatsoever. Tube screen is going to go there. So the, the rune stone. Now, one thing, to, one thing I've just noticed, which I hadn't really thought about, is on all of my pedals, except the ditto, the jack sockets are on the top. That's very handy. So they, the pedals can go closer together and it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. However, I've got the space on the board so I can happily put a bit more space. Once that goes down, that's good stuff. Yeah. Now, getting it off is a pain in the bum. I use a common or garden kitchen knife. Common or garden. Which well, sounds, sounds like you're cutting the Velcro to bits, but you're actually not. No. And that, that just eases it off the board um, without you know, pulling the Velcro off or... Yeah, it's a good so that, to do it. that sits quite nicely and that is how I attach, we attach pedals to the board. The downside, one problem is that stuff does not stick very well. To rubber. To rubber that you get on the bottom of a Boss pedal or on the bottom of an Ibanez pedal of this hmm. generation. So we'll see how we get on. We'll stick some on there and we hope it won't fall off too much. So our pedals are now stuck to the board, but before you do that, there's one thing you need to make sure of. If we have a look at Mick's board here, so as Mick's saying that as uh, his in and out jacks are top mounted, which means it's very easy for Mick to get to the uh, input and output jacks on the pedals. The way that mine have been laid out, um, I can still get there. However, if you have a look between the output of this pedal here, and then the input of the memory man, 
it's even with a really super thin board, it's not that easy. So uh, what I will do sometimes is I will actually have the, the pedals sort of laid out roughly in the same the basic, the same sort of shape. I'm using um, soles on a you know made to measure patch cables, and I'll actually do the patch cables first, and then sort of one at a time put the pedals on with the patch cables in, and I'll show you how I do that. Um, but it's important to note that if you, if for whatever reason you can't, you know, get the patch cables in when the pedals are down, then having to sort of, if you know, if you're using pedal board tape and they're down, they're really fully attached, it's really difficult to then start ripping things up. Yeah, yeah. If you if you've cable tied your pedals down, then you've got to snip all the cable ties off, you know, and basically start again. So just make sure if you're going to attach your pedals at this stage, you can get the jacks in and out. If not. Um, you either lay it out like this, or another really good option is to put some paper on top of your board and then put the pedals on there, lay it all out, and then once the cable jacks are in, pull the paper out from underneath, Bob's your uncle. Yeah, do it in one bunch of flowers. <laughs> so, the way you normally build a board is you do the layout first, then you do the power next, right? Yes. So if you're coming from a collection of pedals on the floor, like we were talking about in the introduction, you might have a combination of batteries, um, the supplied power adapters that you get when you buy a pedal, mm -hmm. you might have some plugged into an extension lead, which is sort of trailing over towards your towards your board, or you might be using a basic power supply and some daisy chains. We're gonna not use daisy chains, right? As a, as a rule, we don't use daisy chains. There's always a better option than using a daisy chain. And as a matter of fact, I you know I certainly uh, am a firm believer in when you're using a board like this, if you've got if you've got a hundred pounds to spend on doing a board, spend 10 pounds on the actual board <laughs> and 90 pounds on the power supply. The power supply yeah, yeah. Because the power supply, if your power supply is not great, your pedals will never sound great. You, they'll, um, yeah, they'll only ever sound as good as your power supply can make. Yeah, it's a very confusing thing though, isn't it? Because there's so many power supplies on the market. Yeah. Um, they all claim lots of things. And if you want to know more about power supplies and all of that, please watch our VCPI episode from a couple of years back. Vic P. Vic P, yeah. Voltage, current, polarity, isolation. You need to get all of those things right if you want your pedals to go right. Very and we'll good. discuss some of those. Yeah. Uh, options here. Daniel, what power option are you using? So because I've got the memory man here which draws more than a standard, um, just a standard 9 volt I standard output will allow, I am going to use um, the Gigru stuff because uh, we have this Time Lord I standard adapter and that's going to give the memory man everything it needs. Hold your horses there cowboy. Um, Let's put some numbers on that. First pedal, how many milliamps? Uh, one. Yeah. Three. Nothing. S sometimes seven. Standard overdrive pedal, how many milliamps current draw? Uh, sometimes 20. It at the, less yeah, than 100. Much less than 100. Yeah, usually much, less, less than, than 50. Than yes, absolutely. Um, most TC electronic pedals? Around a hundred. Hundred, hundred and twenty, yeah, something like that. Yeah. So when you're talking about more current than a standard pedal, what you mean is more than a hundred and fifty milliamps. More than hundred and twenty milliamps. Okay, hundred and twenty milliamps. Your, that's that's quite high for a standard yep. pedal. So anything more than that, I am going to look at putting it on its own. High current supply. So yeah, you know your if you have a um, and how do you know how many milliamps your your pedal draws? It will say in the manual. If yeah. you have any doubt whatsoever, go and check the manual, and on it will website. say on the yeah, on, on the website uh, and in the, uh, the the specification section where it says it take where it takes nine volts. The it'll say the size of the plug for for a standard. Um, a standard nine volt plug, it's 2.1 millimeter and it's center negative. Now that means the positive part of the supply is on the outside 
and the negative part of the supply is what they call negative tip or, or negative center. So that's standard in the guitar industry. Um, anything different, so all of these use a 2.1 center negative power supply, nothing different with that. The main difference with this pedal is I need to be able to supply this with at least 250 milliamps for this to, to do its thing. Yep. Um, but everything else is very, very low. And you'll see if you buy something like a um, Strymon Zuma or mm -hmm. um, a T-Rex something or other, or a, what's the really famous one? Um, Pedal Power 2. Yeah, by Voodoo Lab mm -hmm. that everyone uses. It'll say on each of those outputs, it'll say what the current supply is. But you're going to use the gig rig generator, which is your power supply. Yeah. Um, uh, the gig rig dance company makes a, a modular power supply, which is at one end, super professional, powering lots of very famous people's touring boards across the world. At the other end, it's modular, so you don't need to buy the whole thing. One downside about power supplies, which I've done many times, is you go, I'm going to buy this power supply. And you buy that, and then you use it for 18 months, and then you realize, ah, I've got this new pedal. It won't do five, another 500 milliamps. There you go. So I've got to buy a whole new power supply. So the way Dan does it, it's modular, and therefore it can grow with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, however, you know, you know it's, it's a great power supply. It works really well. The most important thing, though, with if you're looking at a, a board like this, you've got four pedals. You need to make sure that the power supply that's going into each one of these is isolated. What that means is there's not going to be an earth connection on the power, on the, ne on the negative, I'm saying about the center negative. There's not going to be an earth connection from that between each pedal. And that's going to stop earth loops, which noise. is going to make, yes, yeah, exactly. And that's noise. Um, so as long as your power supply is properly isolated. Now, there are some power supplies that say they're isolated, and they're not. This is a really great example. Check this out. I only learned about this recently. This is a Mission Engineering 529, and it is interesting because it runs it off USB, so yep. you can run it off your phone charger. Nice. If you want. However, as soon as you're talking about ground loops, which I think is interesting, mm -hmm. if I don't run it off my phone charger, and I run it off my separate battery that I carry around, right? to power my mobile phone, and if I'm out and about and I need to charge my mobile phone, it's just a battery that you can get. So if I run that off that, what, 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 what's the result? Well, there's no connection between that and... So there's no ground, no yeah. possibility of ground loops, yeah. which I, I think is a pretty cool... It's great, it's great. And, and it's, you know, the fact that it's rechargeable, so you don't have to find a... Yeah, you know, so what we don't know is how long it'll last. Yeah. Because I haven't tested it yet, so this will yeah. be its first outing today. And it doesn't stop there being grounding issues between the outputs, but it says it's isolated. Okay, great. So we're going to assume that it is. And as we were talking about, if Simon can get a close up of that, we've got four outputs at 150 milliamps. Yep. And remember, we were talking about the golden number being about 120. Yep. yep. So we know we can power most pedals, certainly all of these. Yes. And then there's one at 500 milliamps for anything like a timeline, digital, something, like. yeah, something yeah, that's great. that takes a lot. So that is a pretty cool little option, I think. That's fantastic. And that's going to go on here in a sec. Perfect, perfect. Um, any any uh, power supply, you know, the ones that plug into the wall, there still should be no earth connection between the wall and the negative output on the power supply because there's a transformer in there that is isolating that. Um, but yeah, the great thing about the the charge and, and go boards is that, you know, A, you don't have to find somewhere to plug them into the wall when you're playing. Mm. No, that, that's brilliant. I don't think, that doesn't hold any charge, I don't think. Right, okay. I think you have to power something to it. Okay. I think, we'll find out. Okay. Cool. Um, so in terms of connecting it up, do you want to do yours first? Sure. Sh show us how you're going to do that. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start at this end and work my way back. So, I'm going to put this pedal on here. Now, uh, I actually want the output um, from this to go into the tremolo. So, uh, you know, when I get back to laying these out here, I'm just going to be aware that, uh, you know, the patch that I, that I make for this is going to be a bit longer. But the first thing I'm going to do is plug in 
this Time Lord and I will I'm just going to put a little bit of Velcro on that and attach that to the underside of the board. I'm going to do the same. One thing to think about when you put your power supply underneath the pedal board is look where all the outputs are. Yeah. If it's something like a T-Rex or a Voodoo Lab, it's going to have an IEC, a mains outlet on it. So that needs to be somewhere that you can physically get to. For example, if you put it, if the IEC was here and you put it in there, you can't get the the IEC in, and you think, what idiot would do that? I've done it many times. <laughs> <laughs> so your, all your ins and outs need to be accessible. And then it's a case of simply picking a place that feels relevant. Actually, on that front, some pedal boards are completely flat, mm -hmm. which means you have to put your, pedal, your power supply up top. Yes. Which is fine if you've got room, but if you don't have room, a, a pedal board that has a little bit of raise on it, now you'll see, um, this happens to be my little uh, Metro 16, and I've customised it here with this rail well, interesting for exactly is, that reason. The reason I asked you if this was yours, because I've got one of these, I did exactly the same <laughs> thing. So, um, same as the same as you would for a pedal. Look, I would use pedal board tape both sides for power supply. Yes, absolutely. Because it doesn't really need to move. So, on it goes. I'm running very, very short on pedal board tape. Uh, so this will prove whether you can actually use really tiny bits or not. And you can see relatively to the size of the supply, that's actually quite a small amount of tape. Here's a bit that I'm reusing, so that's almost definitely going to fall off. Um, such is the professionalism of how we work, Daniel. And I'm going to stick that in there like that. Nice. And I've, I've put a safety soft thing down underneath so my pedals don't get damaged when they hit the table. You see, there's enough room here for Mick to get the, the USB in for when he needs to charge it again. Yep. So when you buy a power supply, such as the Mission here or any of the other kind of all-in-one power supplies, they usually come with connection leads. Now, depending on your pedal type, you'll have different types of connector. Most modern pedals use that barrel style. Um, connector, which Dan was talking about earlier. One end goes in the power supply, one end goes in the pedal. Um, and you can make a choice. There's a straight one and an angled one. Um, often on top mount pedals, for example, the power supply inlet will often be between the jacks. So you could potentially use a right angle one if you've mm -hmm. got enough room to get the jack in. Sometimes, depending on how it's positioned and if there isn't enough room, it can make more sense to use the straight one because then your jacks can definitely go in beside it. But that's that's up to you. Um, yeah, completely up to you how you want to do it. Same uh, goes for the, for the power supply. It might be that the right angle ones will all fit in. It might be that sometimes they don't because they're too spaced too closely together. I've had that on power supplies before where you're trying to get them all in. So whichever way you do it, one end in the supply, one end in the, in the pedal, taking care to make sure that you're connecting the right thing to the right thing, bearing in mind voltage, polarity, current, and isolation. That was actually Vic P, not Vic P. I'm basically doing the same thing as Mick, but because my power supply requirements are a little bit more complicated, um, so I have to use that extra adapter uh, to power the, the memory man. The way this supply works is I've attached the, so this is the main supply, this is the generator that sits on top. That is going down to here, this is the distributor. And that is going to send power to the isolator. There's four isolated nine volt uh, outputs on here. That will go to the four lower current pedals and then the time lord here, it's going to be connected by the distributor, and that will be powering the memory man. One thing about making pedal boards is even a simple pedal board like this could be quite time consuming, and as you can see, it's getting dark. <laughs> so, um, I've got to the point where I've connected all my power. I only had four to connect, as I mentioned, on the back here of the uh, 529. 
all the leads come through, everything's where it needs to go. So I just want to tidy that up a little bit by, because so I've got all this spare cable, which I just need to make sure isn't going to get snagged on, um, you know, whatever else goes underneath the board. So I'm just going to gather it up. There's probably a neater way to do this, but I'm just going to gather it up. And I'm going to put a cable tie around it, which feels kind of permanent, but it literally takes three seconds just to snip if you've got a problem. So, I mean, ideally I would have checked that everything's working first, but anyway, um, so we'll do that. I'll just snip the end off of that. And then in true DIY nasty fashion, I'll probably just put a bit of tape over there just to hold that down, um, which is neither professional nor it won't last forever, but it will do for now, right? Exactly. It's important to only use orange um, orange tape because it sounds better than the black tape. No question. No question. Orange is sort of, that pedal shows color in a way. So, uh, so yeah, that's not gonna tour. You wouldn't want to put that on a plane um, or subject it to too much uh, problematicsness, but uh, it is going to hold for now for the purposes of our requirements. Happy days, there we go, powered up. <laughs> now I'll test if it works. <laughs> so the correct way to do this is before you've just velcroed and cable tied anything down, but I've got my little battery here, big battery, that end in there, this end underneath. And I've just about left enough room to get the USB thing in there. The blue lights come on, which means it's working. And I can just check up top. Delay works, ditto is working, runestone is working, tube screamer is working. Great. So I can go ahead and do my um, patch cables. Shall I do that, Daniel? Or you I... do that. No, okay, do so that. Dan's still wiring. Um, I'm going to use off-the-shelf patch cables because I've got them. Um, Dan's going to do some make-your-own ones. So this is just an off-the-shelf. Uh, these are free the tone, but you know everyone makes patch cables. Some that I particularly like. Never actually used them in anger, but these rock bag ones um, have this flat very flat profile. So if you've got, not got much space, that can be a good idea. I do worry a bit because they look unrepairable and I don't like things that aren't repairable. Uh, but anyway, another option. These soldered, nice, professional, will last forever, potentially. I've decided that the pedals are gonna go in this order as we discussed, and then it's a case of just connecting the pedals. So you can just get a patch cable of the appropriate length, Connect them up. That's a bit awkward. A bit too short. Almost a bit too short that one, um, which is you know bothering me in an OCD fashion. But we're going to stick with it. Um, a couple more, slightly longer one for this connection. I was talking about this earlier about the uh, where the power comes out and where the jack plug goes in, and sometimes that can create a problem for like here, for example, with the ditto. So. I'm trying to, I want to plug my patch cable in there and it won't go in because the, it's just annoying me. So little, little things like that, little orientation issues um, can drive you mad as they're driving me mad at this point. So you just need to work around it and make sure. Sometimes it might mean repositioning the pedal. In this case, it's just me not being nice. incredibly dumb. You could also thread that one under here and come up here. Yeah, okay, so should you should or shouldn't you put your cables under and over? Um, upside is keeps the top of the board neater. Can use up length of cable that you're that you don't need on the top of the board. Downside it can get tangled under there um, and potentially snag on things. So as you can see underneath the board here, that's quite a lot of loose cable. So could get caught on something potentially, but I'm not going to worry too much about that in this instance. There you go. So my guitar comes in here into the tube screamer, into the runestone, out of the runestone, into the delay, 
out of the delay, into the ditto, out to my amplifier. My pedal board, Daniel, is ready to go. Oh man, you smashed it. Okay, my power is done. I'll double check that now. So, everything turns on except for this one, but you need to remember certain pedals only turn on when you have the input jack plugged in. Uh, so there we go, everything's turned on. Happy days, now I'll make the audio connections. So what I'm doing to make the audio connections, I'm actually using, uh, these are the, the cables I use on all my professional builds. Uh, this is the Evidence Audio SIS system, the screw-in solder system. It uses a very specific sort of cable. This is a solid core cable. So it's different to most uh, solderless systems in the fact that the the core is solid and that screws directly into the tip. But the, what I like about these is you can cut them to length and make them exactly the length you need them uh, for the board. One tip I would say, if you can, if I'm doing a board for a specific tour and these are the pedals and that's it, then I'll make the cables you know, really neat, exactly to length. If, if it's a board that is going to be you know, that's a nice pedal, but I might swap it out for something later. If you can, leave a little bit of headroom in the length of the cable so that you've got a little bit of leeway. Um, I have got, just to prove Dan's point, I've got a bag of two short patch cables here. <laughs> ones that I've made. And then when I got my new pedal board, even lengths that were that long, weren't long enough to do the new pedal board. So right. I've got, this cable is Expensive, right? Yes, absolutely. it's crazy expensive. There's probably 50 quid worth of offcuts off in yeah. this blooming bag and jack plugs still. The reason I'm keeping it is because it will live again. Yes. The other thing that's really important if you're making your own cable is that uh, a lot of the times with this sort of cable that the earth is simply pushed against the, the inside of the plug. Now that's fine, but if for whatever reason I don't have uh, an earth connection between this pedal and this pedal, then I don't have an earth connection between my guitar and the amplifier. So it's really important uh, that you make sure that the you're not only getting the audio through from tip to tip, but that the earth connections are good as well. Uh, so ideally you would be testing these. It's a minefield, isn't it, the, the make your own cables? It is. I, I had a problem on my big pedal board uh, before we did our show a week or so ago. My tube oh, screamer was, screamer, was yeah. buzzing, and yeah. do you remember in a couple of shows, I was like, my tube screamer is yep. buzzing, something's wrong, I just need to fix it. And it was a cable. It was a cable, but in interestingly, all the rest of my cables on my board are these, right. which we've made carefully with the screw in and everything. Yep. This was a lesser cable <laughs> with a less good connection, right. and surprise, surprise, that's the one that's gone wrong. Yep. And if I'm honest, the reason I've used these ready-made, high-quality, is because I've got to a point where I don't really trust anything apart from that. Yep. So I don't have time to make those. I've got these, I trust these, they're soldered, they're high quality. That's what I'm gonna use. Sure. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through, finish off this cabling, and then the board is ready to go. Final thing, I think it always helps to name your pedal board, Dan. As you can see, I've called mine Axis Board of Love. Ha ha ha. All right? Very nice, very nice. <laughs> Even though it's not Jimmy inspired. No, very So uh, what do you want to call yours then? Uh, what was the name of the computer in Space Odyssey 2001? Hal? Hal. This is Hal. <laughs> Ta-da! Ta Here we are then. Axis Board of Love and Hal, and Hal. are in place. Um, let's start with you. Okay. Right. Check everything works. All right, so my straight through tone, so there's no buffers on this board. This is the uh, direct straight through to the amp.
So that's the AC15, and it's set up to be a little bit just breaking Crunchy up a munchy. bit. Breaking yeah, up a just bit. a little bit. Uh, okay, so this is the rattle. Uh, this is the black box. Fabulous. Uh, some delay. Not much wrong with that, mate. Ah! Killer. So yeah. go and gig that tomorrow. I could absolutely take that to a gig tomorrow. Yeah. And get, you know, most of what I need. Very cool. Very very cool indeed. Okay. Uh, so I'm using Dan was using a Vox AC15 with a greenback speaker. I'm using a Blues Junior with whatever the standard speaker comes in the Blues Junior, and that is a version three Blues Junior, not the newest one, which is version four. Okay. And in straight into the amp, it sounds like this. <laughs> Great sound. Quite middly. Yeah, but really focused and, and crisp. Lots of, and lots of presence, actually. Lots of presence. These saddles are giving me lots of presence, which we'll come back to in another video. Uh, TS10 Tube Screamer. Stone, which is the more blues breakery higher gain thing. Oh, hello, ladies. Okay, we've got some. Let's come back to that one. We've got some trouble there. Okay. Okay, I think I know what it is actually. Okay. I know the pedal functions well because I had it on my pedal board yesterday. Okay. So I know that the ped there's nothing wrong with the pedal. Okay. Which you wouldn't know if you were building your first pedal board mm. or a pedal board, but I know that pedal is functioning right because I had it on my own big pedal board yesterday and it was hammering. Okay. Okay, so. Let's come back to that one. Come back to that one. Okay, Echo 6.
Right, so we know everything's working nicely, uh, except this is not working. So, can I just say, yep. this sounds unreal. Isn't it good? Unreal. Yeah, yeah, I'm quite pleased with that. Yep. Okay, so. I know what that is, Dan. Okay. I've experienced it many times before. That is not isolated. There is some noise getting to that mm -hmm. pedal from another pedal. How are we going to diagnose it? We're going to, first of all, we're going to try another power socket, right? Just to make sure that it's not this specific one. So we'll try the tube screener one. Okay. Same jobby. Same job. Okay. I think, I suspected this might be the case. Because we've said it a million times, not all power supplies are created equal, which is, is not true. to say anything bad about the uh, the Mission One, but it's very rare that they work brilliantly. Uh, and there's usually some sort of isolation issue somewhere along the line. So this is going to prove if there is an isolation issue. Okay. This is a Gigwig virtual battery, mm -hmm. which will isolate. Mm -hmm. So it's a separate isolation device. Yeah? Exactly. Now it was only happening on this pedal. Yep. So maybe there is something particular about the rune yeah, stone sure that's fussy. Is. Yeah. But that's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's going to happen. You're going to have pedals that have got different requirements and different levels of fussiness. Mm -hmm. Can we hear it with that on? There we go. So voltage. Current, polarity, isolation, isolation, and there we are.
There we go. Brilliant. Build your oh, first, brilliant. Build your first pedal board. Make a space movie by awesome. the end of the day. Fabulous. There you go, guys. I really hope you enjoyed that. I thought that was an absolute blast. That was brilliant fun. Really good fun, yeah. Yeah, really great fun. Okay, a massive thank you uh, to our patrons on Patreon. Uh, these guys uh, support us. Uh, and So couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Also, massive thank you to everyone that's gone to thatpedalshowstore.com and purchased a T-shirt or strings or a DNM drive or a hat or garden utensils. Coasters. D there we go. Notebooks. Uh, um, your own satellite. Uh, SUV following yep. thing. Uh, massive thank you to our preferred retailers in the UK and Europe is... Anderson's Music of Guildford, Surrey, where you can probably buy most of this stuff. Yes. But not that, because they don't make it anymore. Okay. Uh, in the US of A... Uh, Riff City Guitar of New... Anyway, of various hey, locations. Hello, Joe, where you and can everyone out there. definitely buy one of these. Yes. Uh, also to our friends in Australia, Matt at Pedal Empire in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. Awesome. Hope you enjoyed that, guys. Uh, also, please subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Have a fantastic week, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.